On the fourth day of March, 1794, the brig Falmouth sailed from Port Royal, Jamaica, bound to Belfast, to which place she belonged. At the time she sailed, Captain William Corran, master of the brig, was sentenced to be executed at Halifax, Nova Scotia on July 21st for the most barbarous, inhumane and bloody murder of Mr. Joseph Porter, a passenger on board said brig, by hewing him into pieces with a remarkably large and heavy cutlass. I'm Ratcliffe and this is Confessions of the Hangman. Here is a tale which seems pulled from a Hollywood film and, and a mystery with no motive. Captain Coran, who so inhumanely murdered Mr. Joseph Porter on board the brig Falmouth on her passage to Belfast and was afterwards carried into Halifax, was brought to trial there by a court of admiralty which met and found him guilty and was accordingly executed on the beach at Point Pleasant. Nothing materially happened on the voyage until two of his hands, Boyd and Carroll, were taken sick and died apparently of a violent fever, the one immediately after the other. During their illness, the captain monitored their situation and looked at them down the hatchway. After the death of these men, there appeared an apparent difference in the conduct of the captain. They would show himself in particular instances of harsh treatment towards one or other of the crew, whom he charged with the intention to poison him and run away with his vessel. Very soon after the death, they spoke to American schooner, the master of which Captain Corn had before been acquainted with, and who, on hearing that he'd lost two of his men, offered to supply him with two more. Captain Corrin thanked the American for his friendship, but told him he would endeavor to do what the hands he had. This circumstance appeared strange to the crew, as the loss of the men had rendered them but weak-handed. On the 2nd of May, he took from the mate a quadrant, which he had given to him soon after their sailing, and likewise took from him his books of navigation taking it into his own hands the entire navigation of the vessel. Now Mr. Porter, the passenger, was in an extreme ill state of health. He was so feeble as to be confined to his bed, which was in the starboard stateroom. In this situation he lay till the 24th of May, when the mate, being in the larboard stateroom, and the captain and Mr. Porter's servant in the other cabin, the mate heard Captain Corrin in warm language abusing Mr. Porter, swearing that he should not stay any longer in that stateroom, and ordering his black servant to go immediately and bring his master into the cabin. This the servant attempted, but finding himself unable to effect it, and Mr. Porter at the same time begging for God's sake that he might be suffered to lay where he was, the captain entered the stateroom and with the assistance of the servant took Mr. Porter by force out of his bed and support him under his one arm and the servant under the other, they brought him into the other cabin, he being unable to walk himself and sat him down in a chair. The captain then ordered the servant to bring out his master's bed and make it up in the cabin upon two chests belonging to Mr. Porter. This being done, he compelled the servant to lay his master on the bed, and then sent for one of the top gallant studding sails, of which he made a sort of curtain to surround the bed. After this transaction, he ordered the servant out of the cabin, and then going up on deck, gave general orders that neither the servant nor any other person should come into the cabin without his leave, and that no person should concern himself with Mr. Porter as he would take care of him, himself. On the night of the 26th of May, about midnight, the captain sent for the cabin boy. The boy came to him, and the captain ordered him to fetch a candle. After he had brought it, he demanded of the boy where he had been, 
and the boy replied it was his watch below. He then ordered him to strip off his jacket and after which he bid him go to the locker and bring the cat and nine tails. The boy went to the locker and he told the captain he could not find it. He threatened to strike the boy with his cutlass if he did not find it immediately. The boy not being able to find it again, he accordingly struck him with the flat of the cutlass, after which he took a pair of handcuffs out of the drawer of the cabin and he put it upon the boy's hands. He then put a pistol to his breast and threatened to shoot him. After some time, the boy took the first opportunity to make his escape out of the cabin. And as he ran across the deck, he desired the men at the helm, if the captain inquired for him, to tell him that he jumped overboard. The boy ran forward, got into the hold, and hid himself for three days, subsisting on some Indian corn and sugar which he found in the hold. Immediately after the boy left the cabin, the captain fired his pistol through the cabin window and shattered them considerably. The 27th of May, between the hours of 10 and 11 o'clock at night, the captain called Henry Gilmore and ordered him to bring a light. When Gilmore came with the light, the captain gave him a drink of grog and told him that he hoped he would be in his favor and that he was not afraid of the law. Gilmore replied that he did not wish to be against him or any person. The captain soon after came upon deck and desired that no person should be permitted to come into the cabin without orders from him and that the watch then on deck should give the same charge to the watch, which was to succeed. About a quarter past twelve, the whole crew were alarmed with the cries of Mr. Porter, exclaiming, Murder! Murder! Through the hole in the bulkhead which parted the steerage from the cabin, and by looking down the companion door, several of the crew saw Captain Coran striking Mr. Porter as he lay in his bed with the cutlass. After striking him for some time, he desisted for a short space, and coming up the companion's ladder began to abuse Mr. Porter, and declaring he was not worth five pounds in the world, he then returned into the cabin again, and began to cut Mr. Porter as he had done before. Mr. Porter again cried out and begged the captain not to cut him so, but to take out the pistol and shoot him, but the captain would not shoot him. But he would cut him every half hour until daylight. In a short time, Mr. Porter begged him to desist as he was dying, and it is supposed that he expired about this time, as his cries were heard no more. And between one and two o'clock, the captain came again on deck with the cutlass in his hand, and then he struck Mr. Porter's servant across the shoulders and bid him go down and dress his master's wounds. He also called for a light and went down with the servant into the cabin and made several strokes at Mr. Porter's body with the cutlass, exclaiming, What? What's with you? Are you sleeping? About daylight, the captain called John Dotart to the cabin, who... On his entering it found Mr. Porter with his knees on the cabin floor and his face resting on his bed, apparently lifeless. Captain Coran ordered him to take hold of Mr. Porter's legs and lift him onto the bed. While Dothart was in the act of doing this, he made several strokes at the body over his head, which so intimidated Dothart that he dropped the body and ran on deck and acquainted his companions that the captain had murdered their passenger. At four o'clock the captain came on deck and ordered Dothart to go down in the cabin again and sew Mr. Porter up in the blanket, and he told him that Mr. Porter's servant would assist him. Dothart refusing to do this, he seized him and compelled him by force to go in the cabin. By the captain's orders with the assistant of the servant, he laid poor Mr. Porter's body on one of his own blankets and sewed him up in it, and then he tied a white handkerchief round his head. The body was mangled in a most shocking manner. 
There were large gashes about his hips, about a foot long. He was also much cut about his arms. The sheet was very bloody, and much clotted blood was on the floor near the bed. After the body was sewn up, Captain Corran ordered Dothart and the servant to throw it out the cabin window. Now Dothart told him they were not able, and requested his permission to call another person. He replied that he would let no other person in the cabin to help him. On the finding, however, that they were not able to effect the purpose themselves, he consented that Henry Gilmore should be called. By the assistance of Gilmore, the corpse was bought on deck and laid upon a board in the gangway. From the companion door of the gangway, there was a considerably large quantity of blood which had run through the blanket as they were carrying the body along. While the corpse was laying in the gangway, the captain came on deck, leaned over the quarter rail, covered his eyes with his hands and appeared for some time much confused. He was roused from his reverie by John Dothart, who asked him if they should heave the deceased overboard. He seemed startled by the question, but bid them away with him. The body was accordingly committed to the sea. Immediately after this, he ordered the vessel be kept away northwest and set the studding sails. The maid was obliged to keep out of the captain's way and was once forced to go into the foretops, and at other times he had to conceal himself in the hold, as he had been threatened to take away his life, and if he had pursued him, and apparently for that purpose, being whenever he came on deck, constantly armed with the cutlass and the pair of pistols. Now on the 29th of May, the captain sent several messages to the mate, desiring him to come on deck, and declaring that he should not hurt him. The mate accordingly came up to the fore scuttle, and being afraid to go aft, remained before the windlass. Captain Coran, observing his shyness, and that his eyes appeared perpetually on him, told him he kept a sharp lookout. After this, he went down in the cabin, and kept for a considerable time hammering with a maul, which led the crew to fear that he wanted to force the lumber port in order to founder the vessel but then afterwards it appeared that he had been driving a great number of spikes into the after scuttle to fasten it down. About noon, Henry Gilmore, who had been steering, was relieved from the helm, and then he came forward, where the mate was, who inquired of him what course they were steering. He informed him northwest, on which the mate replied that the course would fetch no port in Europe, and that he was apprehensive that the captain had ill designs on them both and the vessel. The mate then consulted as many of the crew as he conveniently could, who agreed to take the first opportunity to secure the captain. About an hour afterwards the captain came on deck and having walked to the tiller's ropes and turned around to proceed down the deck, Joseph York, who was then at the helm, seized his arms behind and struggling with him, the rest of the crew came to his assistance bound him and brought him into the cabin where they secured his hands with a pair of handcuffs which they found in the chest. Previous to his imprisonment when he had ordered the vessel be steered northwest, he informed the crew that they were near the English Channel, but on the 30th of May when the mate had got possession of his quadrant again, he was able to take an observation and he found that they were near the latitude of this place and in about half an hour they saw land, but a thick fog coming in, they were not able to make harbour till four days afterwards, when they came to anchor in Rose Bay between Le Havre and Lunenburg. On searching for the books of navigation, after confining the captain, they found that he had cut out every book, the table of the sun's declinations. Immediately on their arrival there, the mate went ashore, and made report the magistrate of the transaction on board the brig Falmouth. The captain was carried on shore, and the deposition of the people being taken, he was committed to prison, and afterwards brought to Halifax, where the court of admiralty was assembled on Friday the 11th of July. 
at the courthouse for the trial of this unfortunate man for the murder of Joseph Porter. The court being opened with the customary solemnities, the prisoner was arraigned and pleaded not guilty, and he was remanded for trial. On that day the trial commenced and continued by adjournment till Tuesday, when the examination on the part of the Crown being ended, the prisoner was called upon by the court to make his defence. But declining to offer anything in his defence, he was again recommitted, and the court adjourned at nine o'clock. On the Tuesday, the court again assembled, and the prisoner having nothing to say in his defence, the court was ordered to be cleared. After a short period, the court was again opened, and the prisoner brought to the bar, when His Excellency Governor Wentworth, the President of the court, addressed the prisoner, and declared that the court have deliberately considered all the evidence which had been submitted to them, and unanimously of the opinion that he was guilty of the murder of Joseph Porter. His Excellency then demanded of the prisoner if he had anything to say why sentence of death should not be pronounced upon him. After hesitating a few moments, the prisoner began an imperfect narration of the proceedings on board the brig Falmouth. After her sailing from Jamaica, passing over the period when the murder was committed, of which, however, he declared he was not guilty, and having nothing further to offer, the President pronounced the awful sentence upon him, and he was adjudged to be hanged on the Monday the 21st, between the hours of 10 and 1, at Point Pleasant, between the ebbing and flowing of the tide. Monday came, this unhappy man was carried from the prison to the beach at Point Pleasant, where he satisfied by the forfeiture of his life, the injured laws of the country. Now the above story contains every material fact related on the trial of William Corrin, and there never was a trial in which every witness was called so perfectly corroborated the testimony of his fellow, but in the midst of this coincidence of evidence, the mind is left at a loss for a clue by which to unravel the motive that could induce Captain Coran to commit murder, attended by so many aggravated circumstances. The witnesses all declared that they were unable to sign any reason, and that they knew of no quarrel that subsisted between them and the deceased previous to the 24th of May, when he was ordered out of the state room. That previous to that point, he had treated Mr. Porter very kindly, and that his uniform conduct, both in passage from Belfast to Jamaica and on the passage home until the 2nd of May, had been such as to give no just cause of complaint to any of them. Many have conjectured that a temporary insanity, at least, must have been the occasion of this horrid deed. To this conjecture, every feeling mind must wish to subscribe, especially when the testimony of respectable persons who have known Captain Koran previous to this transaction unite in describing him as a man distinguished by the general quietness and inoffensiveness of his manner. What a contrast do the pleasing ideas that float in his imagination at this period of his time and advanced life, form with the painful reflection that must have crowded in his mind in his last painful visit to Halifax. He feeling noticed the contrast in himself. Here, he explained, I was first made mate of a vessel, and hesitating, he seemed by his manner as if he would have added, here all my worldly prospects end. Here I must make my exit. At the mention of his father's name by a gentleman who attended him in his last moments, he burst into a flood of tears, and he appeared more affected by the contemplation of the distress which his death must occasion to his parents than he had ever shown on his own account. 
I'm Radcliffe, and this is Confessions of a Hangman. <laughs>